to embrace the criticism. After all, don't you want to be part of something that is successful, plentiful, and most of all, profitable? Here at Morningstar Church, we're all about reaching the one. And the way we reach the one is to take the my from your money. What the deal? We don't count, son, yo. We just peel. We spend what we want. Spend what we feel. We straight ball, son. No deal. Cash money, baby. That's what it's all about. Cash money, good living. That's what I'm talking about. Cash money. Cash money. Dollar, dollar, dollar. I need to respond quicker than, than that. That was the most fun I've ever had at a day. I, you paid me to do that that day. That was, that was so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, you know, if you've been here, you, you, you've kind of seen that, but the interesting thing is we've got folks here who are brand new for the first time for baptisms, and they're watching that bumper and go, what in the world kind of church is this? My kids have joined a cult here. Uh, <laughs> I promise uh, we'll explain it. It'll all make sense in just a few minutes. We are so glad you are here, family, friends, uh, to celebrate uh, one of the greatest days that we get to celebrate a few times every year, baptism, lives being changed for eternity. So we're glad you're here. If you're here for baptism or maybe uh, you're just here today because you're looking for some hope, uh, you're looking for some new direction. So if you're joining us online or Facebook Live or here at the campus, uh, welcome. My name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're breaking down this, uh, this phrase because um, we love hard issues. We don't dodge the hard issues. We try to run toward the, the hard conversations, the hard issues. And, and so uh, w- 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 this is a hard thing that culture tends to always say about the church, right? A bunch of hypocrites, you're judgmental, it's what, what you are, are against instead of what you're for. And, you know, the church just wants your money. And, and th- th- you know people. I mean, you have family and friends who think you're kind of weird, kind of naive to come to a church because the church is crooked and corrupt and all the church wants is your money. In fact, y- you might have even said that before you started coming and getting involved in attending. You thought the church just wanted your money. So what we've decided to do is we've ex- actually taken a look at these words and breaking these six words down to see if they really stack up. Do they really hold water? The first week we looked at the first two words, the church, right? And we said it, hey, look, yes, the church asks for your money. But so does everyone else, right? I mean, let's be serious. Everyone asks for your money. You go to the door, the doorbell rings, you go to the mailbox, you turn on the TV, you open, you know, anything, your computer, somebody's there asking for your money. If your kids go to school, if they're a part of a softball team or a soccer team or dance or cheer, somebody's asking for your money. So, yes, the church asks for your money, but so does everyone else. That's the world we live in. Last week, Pastor Keith preached a great message on the last two words, your money. And here's the deal. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, we know that, that you don't understand this and you kind of think that we're weird. But as, as, as those of us who put our trust and hope in Jesus Christ, what we've discovered is that our money is not our money. We've discovered that, that God has given us, God is the source of every good and perfect gift. And while we have to go to work and we have to make money and save money, invest money... Um, We believe that God has put us here and given us all the tools and the resources that we need to be able to do that and that he has blessed us in every way with our time, with our talent, with our treasure, with our very life. He's made us rich in every way so that we can be generous on every occasion so that we can partner with him and build his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, if you missed either of these two messages, I really encourage you, go online or go on Facebook and you can download them. Please watch them. I think there's some good, I think this is the best teaching 
uh, and fun teaching. Uh, we're going really deep, but we're also having some fun. I think it's the best series that we've ever done on stewardship, um, but we'll find out after today. <laughs> Critical, aren't you? Today we're just looking at four letters. One word, just. The church just wants your money. But before we, before we jump in, let me just say this. Let me just say this. If I was not a pastor, right, and if I hadn't grown up in the church, which I did. I grew up in the church, and I've just kind of always assumed, hey, church and money have a relationship. You know, this is what the Bible says. This is about obedience for me, you know. I know the scriptures, and God wants me to be a cheerful giver, and I am. But truly, I give because I've learned that putting God first is the best way to live, and I can never outgive God. But if I could set that aside, if I try to lay all that aside, I could understand why culture would say this. I mean, there's a lot of things that are corrupt in the church. You see a lot of celebrity preachers out there these days flying around in their luxury jets, kind of living the lifestyle that we spoofed here with that opening video. Their vacation homes, their luxury cars, their expensive clothes, and all that gets posted online and people outside the church look at that and they see, well, that, that must be how every preacher in every church kind of rolls. And yet we know, come on, 99.9% .9 of the churches and pastors out there don't roll that way. And so I get it. It's just actually ammunition that the culture needs to continue to fuel this fire that the church just wants your money. Now, if we go back about a thousand years in, in, in time, uh, about halfway between the, the Savior, Jesus coming, and the birth of the early church, and today, about a thousand years ago, there was a tipping point where it could have very well been said the church just wants your money. Now, in those days, you'll remember from your history class that there was only one church in those days. It was the Holy Roman Catholic Church, just one church. And the Holy Roman Catholic Church had these things called indulgences. And an indulgence, by definition, is a way to reduce the amount of penance or punishment you would do in purgatory. And for those of us who grew up Protestants, we didn't believe, we don't believe in purgatory, but... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church believes that there's a place called purgatory, that after you die, you go to purgatory to be purged uh, and made pure before you can go to heaven. You just don't die and go to heaven. You're not totally right with God and ready to go to heaven by anything you do on earth. And so everybody has to go to, you know, either a white collar, you know, minimum security or, you know, really bad you can choose yourself, you, you label yourself, you know, maximum security purgatory, right? And so uh, uh, an indulgence was a way to reduce the, the, the penance, the time, and the punishment in purgatory. Um, and to receive one, uh, what you would do is you go to a priest and you say, hey, you know, I'd like to work out an indulgence. The priest would say, well, I want you to say this specific prayer uh, a certain amount of times every day for so many days. Or I want you to do this, you know, good deed. I want you to go on this spiritual pilgrimage. I want you to, you know, go to this side. I want you to do this something for your neighbor and don't let them know you, you did that. And I want you to do that for the next six months. And indulgences were not like easy. It wasn't like, hey, go home and say the Lord's Prayer once and you're good. Um, it, it, it required something. And, and over time, over time, certain priests began to take advantage of the indulgence system. So somebody would come, you'd go to them and say, hey, I've sinned and I would like an indulgence. And they say, well, you know, instead of saying a prayer or going out and having to do a good deed, just make a donation to the church. And so priests began to sell indulgences. Instead of, you know, making it about a prayer or a good deed, it was just a donation to the church. And, and popes even got in on the action. They would sell indulgences to fund things like the Crusades, for example. Pope Leo X was probably the greatest abuser of the indulgence system. He sold so many indulgences that he was able to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It was at that day, and still to this day, the largest church on planet Earth. Though I think Joe Olstein is getting close. <laughs> Just kind of like size of facility, this is the biggest one. And I'm taking a look at that, and I'm like, wow, that is impressive. And you know, we really need to do some, some upgrades around here. <laughs> and he funded this thing through indulgences, and they... I've been, you know, I follow some of you people on Facebook. I know how you live. I'm thinking, we've got a gold mine right here. 
And so I just put together a straw man. This is nothing that we've kind of accepted. We've not taken it to the board before, but I've kind of just, you know, I'm, I'm floating this out there. What do you, we'll take a vote on it, you know, just on the seven deadly sins. We can all agree, right? Lust, greed, envy, gluttony, sloth, wrath. I think pride I've kind of come in a little low at. I mean, I, the pride's kind of the root, so probably need to raise that one up. Um, again, we're just kind of floating this out there. I do want you to note that I'm trying to be generous here. These are, however, per incident. Every time it's this cost, but you do get 20% off if you pay in advance. And you're laughing, and you're laughing, but the truth is, in those days, back when they were selling indulgences, they would actually sell indulgences for sins you had not yet committed, but knew or were planning on committing. That's how corrupt, that's how corrupt the church had become, because the church, it seemed like, just wanted your money. As you might imagine, the, 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 the huge financial windfalls, more money led to more corruption. So, so why would a priest say, hey, go say a prayer, do a good deed, when a priest could say, hey, make a donation to help fund my next building project, right? And as a result, the church's treasury got richer and richer and richer, but the lives of the people were becoming more and more spiritually bankrupt. All of this culminated, again, you'll remember this from your history, all this culminated in a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Martin Luther, um, you know, getting so riled up that he condemned the church, his church, he was a priest in the Roman Catholic church, condemned his church of basically trying to sell forgiveness and salvation. Remember he wrote his 95 theses, he nailed those to the door of Wittenberg Castle Church and in effect launched the Protestant Reformation. Now, Stay with me for just a second. It, it, it'll tie in here. You'll see this in a, in a minute. But just the Protestant Reformation, if nothing else, you're going to learn something here today, all right? Um, Protestant Reformation did a whole lot of things. One of the things the Protestant Reformation did is it actually not just launched a new, you know, 2.0, church 2.0, the Protestant church. It actually led to the eventual Reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. But a couple kind of hallmarks of the Protestant churches were saved by grace through faith. It's about what God did. It's not about saying a certain number of prayers. It's not about doing a good deed. It's not about do, giving a certain amount of money. It's about what Jesus did, and we put our trust in the fact that he gave his perfect life on the cross to pay for our sins. We receive grace and salvation and forgiveness through faith, but it's a gift, not what we do. Second of all, the Bible became accessible to all people because for the first time, the Bible was actually printed in the language of the people, and you could buy a copy of the Bible that you could actually read because up until then, this sounds weird to us because we see Bibles, we have Bibles on our phone, we have all kinds of apps and all kinds of versions. In those days, if you wanted to hear the Bible, you couldn't read the Bible, if you wanted to hear the Bible, you could go to church, and the priest would read the Bible for you in Latin, most people didn't know Latin, so they were just going on what the priest read. They couldn't even understand, and it was all about how the priest interpreted what the Scripture was saying. Now, the Bible was printed, the printing press was printed in the language, and so you could buy a Bible, take it home, and you could read God's Word for yourself anytime you wanted to. That was a huge revelation. And, 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 and then second, revolution, priesthood of all believers. Two kind of main attributes of the priesthood of all believers. First is that we're all... We're all in ministry, that we're all priests, that we don't have to go to church and have another priest mediate my relationship with God, that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He mediates my relationship with God the Father. And so I, as a, just a common layperson, have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ. Furthermore, this idea of the priesthood of all believers that we find in the New Testament, the epistle of, of Peter, is that all of us... Um, at our baptism, when we put our trust and hope in Jesus, uh, all of us are given gifts, and that we use those gifts together as the church to build the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, that, that we don't just put money in a plate to, pro to pay professional clergy to do the work of the church, that we are the church, and together we're called to live out what God wants for us. The, the church just doesn't want your money. In fact, the, the Protestant Reformation was, was the church's way of saying this. The church doesn't just want your money. The church wants so much more. The church wants you to be in your Bible, reading your Bible every single day. The, the church wants you to discover what your gift, your talent, your skill is, and stack hands and use that 
for the common good. It's not for, for you to use for your own good. It's for you, us to build the kingdom of God together. We want so much more than just your money. We want your time, your talent, as well as your treasure. We, we even asked for this. One of our membership vows, if you've gone through membership, you'll remember. We ask you, hey, do you promise to support this church with your prayers, your, your presence, your attendance, your financial gifts, your serving in ministry, and your witness? Are you going to go out and tell other people to come and, and join to see what, you know, to be a part of what God is doing here through this church? And, and why we do this, I said this just a minute ago, it kind of points to one word, transformation. Here's why we invite people to do this. Why we want more than just your money. We want your life. Because when you begin to give, these are spiritual practices and disciplines. And as you come to church and as you read your Bible, as you serve in ministry, as you share your faith, the world gets transformed because we are the hope of the world. We're called. We're given a commission by Jesus to go out and make disciples of all nations. So if we're doing what we're doing, supposed to be doing, the world should look different, which I don't know about you, but I don't see the trajectory that the world is moving in as an indication that we're really successful right now. Would you agree that we've got a gap, that we've got an opportunity here, that our world is not heading in the direction that's looking a whole lot more like the kingdom of God on earth and heaven? But that's our task. When we're being the people that God has called us to be, when we're going all in and following Jesus, the world is going to look different and so is your life. Because as you hand more and more of your life over to Jesus, he's going to begin to infuse you. Listen, Jesus didn't got, die just so you could go to heaven when you die. He, he died on the cross so that heaven could come and get into you here in this world. Imagine, imagine if the church just wanted your money. Imagine how spiritually bankrupt we as a church would be. Oh, we'd be flush with cash if we had your money. 10%? Man, we could... We could do amazing, I mean, we could, it's amazing what we could do. We'd, we'd, have, we'd have, you know, huge savings accounts. We'd have endowments out the wazoo, Hebrew word for any crevice. <laughs> we'd have endowments out the wazoo, and, 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 and yet, while we would have all this money, people's lives not being changed, People not surrendering their life and following Jesus. Can you imagine how spiritually bankrupt we could be? We would be as a church. Can you imagine what your life would be if the only connection that you had with God? Listen, if the only connection you had with God was a, an auto draft deduction from your checking account once or twice a month. I mean, if the church really wanted your money, just hey, we don't need you to come. We don't need you to participate. We don't need you to serve. We don't need to share. We just want an auto deduct out of your you know checking account twice a month. Can you imagine how hollow your soul would be? Your relationship with God would be like your relationship with Discover Card or your mortgage company? Relationship? It's not the biblical example. It's not how I read the Bible. I, I see Jesus calling fishermen to leave their boats and nets and follow him. I see people leaving their friends and family, their town, and taking the gospel because they were so sold out because of what they had experienced in Jesus Christ was different than anything they'd ever experienced anywhere. They gave their lives, and they followed him, and they shared him to the ends of the earth. And some, many, even gave their life. They were martyred because of the conviction of, of what they were looking forward to in heaven. Friends, listen, the church doesn't just want your money. Forgive us if we've ever so lowered the bar. The church wants so much more, and we see this throughout. This is nothing new. We see this throughout Scripture. For the eyes of the Lord, Second Chronicles, Old Testament, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Is your heart fully committed to God? God's looking for people. He's looking for a few good men and women whose hearts are fully committed to them so He can strengthen you. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, this does not seem like a small ask, Right? To offer your wallet the first 10% of your paycheck. I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper act of worship. Look at what James, this is the brother of Jesus, says. So give yourself completely 
to God. Jesus said it like this. You'll remember the great commandment, right? Love the Lord with some of your heart, some of your soul, some of your mind, some of your strength. When you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, your family is going to look different. Your workplace is going di to look different. Your relationship with God is going to look different. The world is going to look different, and your life is going to look different. Make no mistake, the church doesn't just want your money. The church wants you to go all in. But here's the truth. we got to sell out to go all in. Because if Jesus is not Lord of all, then listen, that's not what Lord means. Lord isn't Lord of part of my life. Lord means you're the leader of every part of my life. If the Lord isn't Lord of all, then the, the Lord, he isn't, Jesus isn't Lord at all. I, I, I want to I explain to this. I want to kind of, you know, illustrate this. You've been probably wondering what is back here. And I've shared this uh, once or twice before. It's, it's just kind of, this hit me one day. It's, this is kind of how I see most people when... When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, what it looks like in our life, and you probably, I don't know, this is not an eye chart. I'm not going to ask you, you know, A or B and, you know. Um, uh, but these are like, these are like uh, areas of our life, big buckets, right? Our career, our family, our friends, personal finances. You could, you could put more stuff up there, but, but these are kind of the big things that affect us, that take our time and our energy, that we spend, you know, time worrying about maybe. And, and, and so the same five in each one of these four. Um, but here's what I usually see happening is how we kind of come and grow in, in faith. We're just moving along one day and then something happens and maybe we come to church or there's a crisis and we learn about Jesus. And at that point, Jesus becomes another one of these columns and categories. And so he becomes important. I mean, we meet Jesus and we, we start coming to church and we start reading our Bible and we start praying and we might give a little money and we might, you know, go to a connect class and discover a gift and start serving a little bit. And so that's an important step. When, when we meet Christ, there's a change. He becomes a, a part of, you know, these other, you know, important things in my life. But as we grow, what happens is, not a lot of room here, Jesus moves to the front of the line. Jesus becomes first place. And so... I get up in the morning, and before I go to work or spend time with my family or, you know, go out and play golf, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and spend time with, with God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God first place, and I'm going to go to worship, you know, every single week. I'm going to give God the first part of my, my finances. I'm going to put God first. And, and, hey, that is a huge move, huge move. But there's one final move, and it's, it's you know, so God calls us to keep taking next steps, and and, and here's where I think God, I, here's where I know God wants all of us to be. And, and yet few people get there is, is to move from Jesus being a part to Jesus being first to actually then Jesus being the foundation. He's the foundation of, of my whole life. What, so what that means is Jesus is not just a segment of or the first part of, but my relationship with Jesus affects the way that I do my job, run my business, relate to my coworkers. My relationship with Jesus affects the way that I, I raise my kids, relate to my parents, deal with the, the hurts from the past. My relationship with Jesus affects the way that I interact with my friends, what I say yes to and what I say no, no to. My relationship with Jesus affects not just the first 10% of my income, but how I spend the other 90% as well. My relationship with Jesus affects my personal life. You understand what I'm saying? If Jesus, he wants to be Lord of every area of our life. And when we start spending time with Jesus, if we really get into our word and we begin to really seek God and, and ask God, strengthen my heart, God, I want to sell out to you. So that Jesus is not just Lord of our life when we go and do our devotion, or not just Lord of our life when we come to worship, but Jesus is actually Lord of our life at work. Jesus is Lord of our life when we, when we post something on Facebook or Instagram. Jesus is Lord of my life when I respond to that critical email. Jesus didn't die. Again, Jesus didn't got, die so that part of you could go to heaven when you die. Jesus didn't die and offer his life on the cross so that heaven could come and get into just one or two areas of your life. 
Jesus came and gave his all so that he could be Lord of all to transform your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But here's the, here's the truth. We have enough, most of us, we have enough Jesus to be informed, but not enough Jesus to be transformed. We got Jesus in the mix. We know it in our mind. We're informed. We've got the knowledge, but, but we don't have enough Jesus. We don't have enough trust to totally hand it over so that he can transform every area of our life. Interestingly, that we trust him with our entire eternity, but sometimes struggle to, to trust him with our career, our family, friends, personal life, finances. And, and, and here's why I think we're afraid. I think we're, we're afraid because if I sell out to Jesus, we think I'm going to miss out on what life has to offer, right? Come on. I mean, it's true. It's, it's the one thing that holds us back. We don't really have faith that God's going to do for us what God says he's going to do for us. If I really go all in with Jesus, then I'm going to miss out on what some of the fun stuff my friends are doing. I'm going to miss out on what my neighbors are doing. I'm going to miss out on keeping up with the Joneses and buying this and going that and doing this and being and having. And if, if I sell out to Jesus, I'm going to miss out on some of the things this world has to offer. And yet we're talking about a God who came in Jesus Christ and said, I have come that you might have life to its fullest measure. And Jesus wasn't talking about when you die and go to heaven. He was talking about right here, right now. He's come that we might have life. We're afraid, though, if we really sell out, we're going to miss out on what this life has to offer. Case in point, uh, if you've read the Bible been to church. Maybe you've heard about this cat. His name was the rich young ruler, right? The rich young ruler. So what we know about him already is, you know, he had it going on. He was rich. He was young. And, and he had power. He had money, possessions, power, all the things that you would think money, you know, everything you would desire. And yet, you know what he was missing? He didn't know. Because he was searching. He had everything, it seemed, but he was searching. He comes to Jesus one day, like so many people who seem to have everything, but there's something this. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, um, what must I do to inherit this, this eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know what the commandments, you're, 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 you know, you've been instructed in, in the Jewish law. You seem like a smart guy. What's the, what's the Jewish law say? And the guy says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and he said, I did, I've done this. He said, I've done this since I was a little kid. Now, if I was Jesus, I would say, wait a minute. You have not done that. You've not loved the Lord. You've not loved your neighbor. I've seen you on Facebook. I know you've not done it. See, I would do i just call him out. But Jesus is graceful. And actually, Jesus sees there's a deeper issue going on. It's not it. He sees this man's heart, right? He says, all right, all right, you've, you've done everything. And, and Jesus says this. He says, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. See, the church just wants your money. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, come follow me. No, he, 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 he didn't say go sell it all and bring it to me. He didn't say go sell it all and take it to the church. He said go sell it all and give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And, and when he heard this, though, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Now, here's what I want you to see. Because I read this story so wrong for so many years. And my guess is that at least, you know, one point in your life, you read this story this way as well. But because I would often read this story, and I'm like, man, that, whew, that is a little much, Jesus. Right? It's like, it, it, wouldn't it make more sense that, you know, hey, go sell 10% of everything you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. That, that seems, that's a lot to ask, but that seems more reasonable. That seems more in keeping with the Bible, Right? We think, man, Jesus is asking this guy to give up so much. But we, we, stop, uh, we, we fail to stop and realize what the rich young ruler really gave up. Because he didn't give up what Jesus asked him to give up. In fact, what he gave up instead was he gave up having a front row seat to the greatest life ever lived in human history. He gave up having 
box seats to all the miracles, the signs and wonders, the death and resurrection. He gave up the privilege of walking with, with Jesus to the to the known world and seeing lives and history, the very turning point, not just the tipping point, but the turning point of all of history. This is what he traded for his stuff. And I have to wonder, on his deathbed, what was his regret? Do you think it was, I wish I had more stuff to take with me? To eternity. Now I want you to contrast the rich young ruler to a fisherman turned fisher of men named Peter. Because Jesus, hey, to be fair, Jesus asked both these dudes to, to give it all up. Right? He, he told the rich young ruler, sell your possessions, give to the poor. Remember what he told Peter? Leave your nets, leave your boats, their whole source of livelihood. This is what everything depended on. Leave that and come Follow me. Same invitation as the rich young ruler. Peter, he left his boat. He left his livelihood. He followed Jesus. Can you imagine the richness of life? Now, certainly Peter had his share, lots of shares of struggles. But do you think on his deathbed, Peter had a regret? Wish I would have never done that. I wish I would have stayed back at that boat at the Sea of Galilee and never traveled more than two miles from that area. Think about Peter's legacy. I mean, we're here 2,000 years later talking about Peter. And by the way, remember that church? Remember the name? St. Peter's Basilica. The rich young ruler, we don't even know his name. Fred. I wish I could, I wish I could show you a building named after Fred. Let me ask you a question. This is the challenge. Let me ask you the same question that I've been wrestling with for the last few weeks. It's a question I wrestled with again yesterday in my, my quiet time. What needs to be reprioritized in my life? Would you spend some time this week asking yourself this question? What needs to be reprioritized? Where's Jesus fitting in to all this? Are there some stuff that's just so out of whack in my career, in my family, my friendships, my personal time, my finances? What needs, what needs to be done differently? Let me, just, let me just tell you, hey, you're done differently is one decision away. It's a decision to go all in with Jesus Christ and make him the Savior in Lord of your life to give him the influence in every one of these areas so that you will experience the life abundant to its fullest measure that Jesus came to offer you and that's what this sacrament of holy baptism points us toward not just the water washing away our sin not just Jesus being our Savior who died on the cross to pay for our sins which he did but also our Lord. Because as we go down in the water, as we are buried, that old life gets buried. We are dead and buried with Christ so that we can experience, like Christ, the resurrection. And we can come up to new life, a different kind of level where Jesus is not just the Savior who paid the price so I could be in eternity, but he's the Lord. He's the Lord of every area of my life. Listen, at Morningstar Church, baptism, there is no fee. At least not here. There is no charge. There is no fee. But make no mistake, it was not free. It cost Jesus everything to offer us the gift of being saved by grace. It's about us putting our faith. It's putting our faith in what Jesus has done to receive him as our Savior but to make him Lord of every area of our life because if Jesus is not Lord of all, come on, then he's not Lord really. Lord at all. 
for those of you who have been baptized. Remember your baptism today. What needs to be reprioritized? If you've not been baptized, what step is God's Spirit nudging you to take today? Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. You love us with so much grace that we don't deserve. You give us mercy. No matter what we've done and how many times we've done it, you still stand there with arms open wide, leaving the 99 to come find the prodigals and welcome us back to regain our place into the family that you have prepared for us in Jesus. So God, forgive all of us for not living up to our calling and our name as Christians, followers of the Christ. Thank you for that grace, and thank you for the grace that not only forgives us, but for the grace that can strengthen us and encourage us to truly live a sold-out life, to go all in with Jesus. And God, if there's a person here who's not taken that step to sell out and go all in, I just invite you, if you're that person and God's nudging you today, say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I, I, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to experience something new in life. So I receive today what Jesus did, the price he paid on the cross for my sin, and, and begin now to fill me with the Holy Spirit so I might know what you're calling me to, to do with my life, how to invest this one and only life. So I don't end up with regret, but I can look back on my life knowing that I've left it all out on the playing field. I pray this in, in faith, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.